Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. The way the news cycle works right now, something absolutely unbelievable can happen, and then a week later, we've all forgotten it. It's been several weeks now since uh, Paul Pelosi, the husband of Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, was attacked uh, in their home by someone who uh, apparently was searching for uh, the speaker, was hospitalized after being beaten with a hammer. And what was surprising to me about this uh, is, is not the shock that that could happen in America. We've seen all kinds of awful things happen uh, in the United States. It was the response to it from some people, including a lot of professing Christians who were uh, having jokes about uh, this attack on social media and that sort of thing, which really revealed a kind of callous uh, nature to violence in America. And so I was thinking then, just as I had been for several weeks with all of the all of the ways that we're kind of holding our breath uh, in the United States, especially since January 6, uh, 2021, for any uh, time in which uh, political violence could erupt, I was wanting to talk to the person that I trust the most on these issues of domestic terrorism and violence, and that's Elizabeth Newman, who was formerly the Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention in the Trump administration's uh, Department of Homeland Security. And she's now a commentator on ABC News and is Chief Strategy Officer for Moonshot, a social enterprise working to end online harms such as uh, child sexual exploitation. Uh, news disinformation, violent extremism, gender-based uh, violence, human trafficking, uh, all of these various things that can happen online and applying an understanding of ethics and, and human rights uh, and democracy to those things. Elizabeth, thanks for being with us today. I'm so delighted to be with you, Russell. Thanks for having me and for addressing this topic on your show. Yeah, I wish we were talking about happier things um, than political violence, but it, it really is something that we need to we need to all be thinking about in American life right now. I, I'm curious when something like this happens. You're somebody who has devoted your life to uh, analyzing, uh, understanding, sort of the mindset behind people who would. Uh, carry out violent acts. When something like that happens, whether it's the Paul Pelosi attack or, or, or something else, are you shocked by that? Or is, is that something that you kind of are expecting right now in American life? I, I'm sadly not shocked. I'm always saddened, um, mm. but not shocked. Uh, it, in fact, if you were to look at the last two years, I and I, many of my colleagues in the counterterrorism community are actually surprised there haven't been more attacks. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's a little bit of a, a good news story. But um, we are just there are a number of factors that are coming to bear and creating an environment that make it very easy from people to move to violence, whether you're talking about a lone actor, which is the case of what happened with Paul Pelosi or mass political violence, which we saw on January 6th. There there are a number of environmental factors that are just creating the right conditions. It's kind of like um, a weather warning. We, We are in that place where you're either in the tornado watch or the tornado warning, like the conditions Mm -hmm. are there. It's very hard to predict where it might occur, um, who and what the vectors are in the targets, but, but you know, it's going to happen. And so no, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sadly not shocked anymore. When something like this happens, uh, usually uh, people will will say, uh, look at the way that rhetoric uh, was being used, uh, targeting a, a political figure who, or, or, or whoever uh, the person is, along with this sort of catastrophic uh, kind of uh, language and the rhetoric leads to this violence. Other people will often say, uh, especially if it's, if it's um, 
a violent actor on their quote unquote side, uh, uh, however they define that, will say, well, rhetoric doesn't lead to this kind of thing because you're dealing with unstable, uh, insane people and, and, and the rhetoric, people who are using rhetoric can't really be blamed for this. How, how would you respond to that as somebody who's worked with this kind of stuff for so long? You know, the first thing that comes to mind as a, a believer is out of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mm-hmm. um, the rhetoric is indicative, even if it's just play acting, right? Because we do have a lot of performative politics um, that make their, their money and get their votes um, off of anger and outrage. Um, but there's a heart condition there, right? Mm-hmm. And um, the, the heart condition that a mass part of our country at this point has bought into is that of anger and hate of the other. And I would suggest that you can't keep that going for too long without it spilling over into other action besides just our words. Um, Now, let me put my counterterrorism hat on. What we know about political violence, about terrorism, Um, the precursors to getting somebody to a point where they will use violence to um, achieve their ends, um, you have to create this cognitive opening. Now, there's a little bit of... um, uh, you know, a little little caveat here around people with mental illness. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's other factors there. If somebody is mentally ill, the words actually can accelerate that violent action mm-hmm. faster. Um, but most terrorism is not conducted. Um, uh, if you look at the the prevalence of the g- mental illness in the general population compared to those who have committed attacks, like it's about equal. So it, it's wrong to say that it's a mental illness problem. There might be mental health challenges mm-hmm. involved. I would I would submit that that is definitely a, a factor that we need to be doing better as a society and helping people address grievance and address difficult times in their life. But it is not a mental illness. So let me set aside mental illness and mm-hmm. and just talk about the the average person out there, when you steep yourself in angry rhetoric and grievance constantly, um, there, there will be side effects. And for some people, those side effects might just be that you have high blood pressure or that you're Mm -hmm. an angry person and you have a hard time having relationships. Like it has an ill effect on society, on your family, but maybe it's not the worst case scenario, but some percentage of people have a number of factors that come into play. They have other vulnerabilities in their background that make them susceptible to that angry rhetoric and they radicalize. Now, um, I like to use J.M. Berger's definition of extremism, and the, his definition is when you um, have when decided that the outgroup, whoever that is, mm-hmm. poses a threat to your in-group success or survival, um, and therefore hostile action is necessary. Mm-hmm. He defines hostile action as a spectrum. And it can go from uh, bullying, just hateful words. So in a sense, if you use his definition, using rhetoric, even if it's protected by the First Amendment, it's still extremism, right? If you mm-hmm. were ostracizing the other in some way with your rhetoric. But the, the thing that most law enforcement are more concerned about tends to be the violence, the, the hate crimes, and then it escalates to terrorism and genocide is a form of extremism. So there's a spectrum of hostile action. The concern we have is that when you have so much of extremist rhetoric in the general population constantly, uh, especially on certain news channels, um, it, it will have a radicalizing effect on some individuals. And it's we're talking about a very small per- percentage of people that are vulnerable. Mm-hmm. However, anytime you start bringing that extremist rhetoric into the mainstream, a small percentage of 330 million people is still still a lot. Um, yeah. and, and it's really um, metastasized in a way the last few years that is very concerning to law enforcement. And I think law enforcement recognizes there's only so much they can do. They really cannot um, arrest their way or disrupt, use the typical tools of law enforcement to, to address this problem. It is so much deeper embedded in society, and we need other tools to try to address it. You know, I think all the time about it's there are probably 
not more than one or two letters to an editor that I've read in my life that I still remember. Uh, but this was one of them. And I've, I've mentioned it here before. It was someone writing into, I think, the New York Times responding to our mutual friend Ben Sass's book, uh, Them, on loneliness. And this was from a, a psychologist, professor of psychology, who said, it's not loneliness. It's, it's, it's these actors that are alone. There is loneliness. But then they find community uh, and, and they find this kind of radical community online that, that has a, a family sort of bond feel uh, to them. And that's what radicalizes a lot of people. Do you agree with that? Is that is that what you've seen? It is certainly a driving factor. We um, if you go back to. Uh, like the 2005 to 2011 time period, uh, the University of Maryland's START Center Studies Terrorism. And they would tell you that from that early time period, most radicalization occurred in person in real life. Um, And then Mm. from 2011 to 2016, it completely flipped. And about 75 to 85% of radicalization was occurring online. Um, Mm. And so what does that mean? One, it means uh, our job is harder, right? If somebody is having to meet with somebody in person to get that piece of literature or to have the conversation, um, it's going to move slower. And there's more opportunities for law enforcement to detect that something might be amiss. Um, when it's online, it's anonymous. You can access anything you want um, and you are more likely to stumble upon it. Whereas in the other offline mode, you kind of have to uh, be proactive and either somebody has to be proactive in recruiting you or you have to be proactive in finding it. So um, there is a, a huge aspect to radicalization occurs um, through networks and through um, a sense of belonging is, is largely um uh, one of the drivers behind or the need, the lack mm-hmm. of belonging and the need to find belonging is one of the key drivers behind radicalization. So whether you're finding that belonging in person uh, now 15 years ago, um, now it's largely online. You it's and I would argue it's false. It's false mm-hmm. intimacy. It's false yeah. belonging. But the, it's meeting a need that has gone unmet in that person's life. Yeah. We, uh, there was a, a person who had worked in, um, in some social media uh, companies uh, and is very concerned about social media who was uh, speaking on a panel I was on uh, a few months ago who talked about this experiment of setting up an Instagram account for this fictional person and uh, just watching the way that that fictional person uh, could be offered white supremacist accounts uh, within just a matter of days, just because that account was liking very mainstream sorts of political uh, or, or news sites that would just kind of move more and more uh, extremely. Is that something that you're concerned about, the way that the algorithms can actually uh, slow motion radicalize people, even if they don't, they don't, they're not seeking it out necessarily at first? So the the data is a little inconclusive on this point right now. There there have definitely been studies on on Facebook and Instagrams, uh, uh, especially around the election period and how quickly um, somebody could literally set up a profile, not touch it, and within weeks be offering it, offered QAnon conspiracies and um, and other types of extremist content. So that that is concerning. Most people have enough resilience factors in their life that they're not going to be susceptible to random things in their feed. They're, they're more likely to be persuaded by somebody they know suggesting mm. that they look at something. Mm-hmm. Um, however, uh, what we are concerned about is you at any given time have a you know decent population of what we would call vulnerable people. Mm-hmm. Um, these are people that have risk factors in their life that um, may be... Uh, have through no fault of their own, and um, they may 
And I just to be clear, at any given time in all of our lives, we might be vulnerable. Arguably, sure. most of us were vulnerable during the last two years of the pandemic, right? Like, mm-hmm. so there are, there are certain aspects. Being vulnerable doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It's just life is hard. And yeah. uh, if you don't have certain um, resilience factors, protective factors in your life, you can be more susceptible to those arguments, those grievances. Um, and so, yes, that's where the algorithm becomes very concerning. It's not that it's going to in mass radicalize people, but that somebody that might not otherwise um, be looking for that radicalizing information might have it served up to them. They might be vulnerable in that moment and they might go down that rabbit hole. Um, But the data is a little inconclusive. That doesn't mean, in my opinion, that I don't want the tech companies to do more. We just don't know yet how prevalent that is as a vector for radicalization. You know, because there are a lot of um, parents and a lot of youth pastors I know that listen to this show, and uh, some of them worry sometimes by saying, you know, what do I, my kid or the kid in my group plays video games that are really violent and, and, and look really kind of bloody and disturbing. Is that something I should worry about? Uh, or is this just the kind of thing that you know, an older generation has always said about the next generation down. Um, There again, I want the answer to be like, yes, video games radicalize. Um, The data doesn't say that it does. Mm -hmm. Um, Here's what I will say, because I I don't let my kids play um, video games. And it's probably I have to explain to my 11 year old frequently. um, I've just seen too much. It's too, Mm. it's a hazard of my job. Like I've, I've watched too, too many real life attacks and it's just a little too disturbing to me. Um, I think there is a desensitization aspect to it. And I Mm. think that if you might be radicalized for other reasons, the games can come into play as a um, preparatory action to be uh, willing to carry out an act of violence, but there isn't um, there isn't necessarily proof uh, in all of the, the research yeah. that's been done on this to say that if your kid plays video games, they're more likely to go commit an act of violence. Um, I, it's 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 more. I would I would put that more in the category of. Um, I would be concerned about who are they talking to online. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that uh, both from a human trafficking standpoint, as well as um, a violent extremism standpoint, uh, people, uh, violent extremists and human traffickers use games to target kids. Um, mm. So to start conversations and yes. the, yeah, to yeah. groom them, um, to groom them for whatever their purpose is, whether it's like introducing uh, concepts about racism or um, other types of grievance or uh, being anti-government in in nature um, or on the other side with human trafficking. Uh, So I I would be much more concerned about who are your children allowed to talk to on those games Mm -hmm. and making sure that it is somebody that you know, that it's just friends or family um, and that is not open to anybody uh, in the internet because as I'm sure everybody knows um, uh, the people that present themselves online are not necessarily who they say they are. So that is more of a concern uh, than the actual game itself. You know, one of the common factors, it seems, uh, with uh, Muslim extremist uh, terrorist uh, groups uh, that we saw in the 9-11 era uh, and uh, groups like Proud Boys and some of these other uh, these other extremist groups, young men. Uh, do, do you think there's something unique about our time that makes young men uh, maybe especially vulnerable to some of these things? Um, absolutely. Uh, I, I, having a, an 11 year old son, this is like something that I am constantly um, thinking about through a very personal lens, not only for him, but for his friends. Um, mm-hmm. how do you, how do you make sure you build those resilience factors and young? Um, so for parents and youth ministers, like, uh, you'll hear me use the word resilience factors and protective factors. Um, that is so, so crucial. Cause as we all know, the teen years are, um, when you're searching for identity and for belonging, like that's mm-hmm. a, the natural way God designed it. It's a good thing. Um, it can also go askew really quickly. And, um, and so 
having those built-in resilience factors and protective factors and having talked to your kids but well before their teen years about what to be on the lookout for, what to be concerned about, uh, both online and offline. Those are all very important steps um, to, to helping uh, helping your kids navigate those difficult years. But yes, I, I, what, what, um, wait, what are, what are resilience factors? So some of those resilience factors include having self-esteem, a healthy self-esteem, having strong ties to community, having a nuanced understanding of religion and theology, or sorry, religion and ideology. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I really want to emphasize that nuance piece, um, what we notice in extremist rhetoric and in conspiracy theories, that there is um, a black and white offering, a there is only one right way, one right answer. And um, if you can train somebody or equip somebody to approach things with nuance, um, that actually has a tremendous ability to, to build resilience um, when they get presented with those uh, uh, conspiracy theories in the future. So nuance is really important. Parental involvement, exposure mm. to nonviolent belief systems and narratives, a diversity of nonviolent outlets for addressing grievance, societal inclusion and integration, and then resources to address trauma and mental health issues. Um, so those are the uh, some examples of resilience factors or ways that we can build resilience into society and, and individuals. Well, you know, it sounds like from what you're talking about, the the ideal situation would be a church that has spiritual fathers and mothers and uh, a church that has a good news gospel and has a sense of belonging. And yet, uh, I, I just was uh, talking not long ago to an atheist, a uh, completely non-Christian person who said that when he goes online, when he sees in someone's bio, sinner saved by grace, he said, I just know that's usually going to be the person who's attacking me in the most vitriolic, uh, personal sorts of ways. And I just stopped and said, ah, oh, that you know, I have to explain sinner saved by grace is good news. So ha- what happens that you have so many people within Christianity, uh, it, it seems, who are becoming radicalized and and extreme and, and using even, uh, I've noticed a lot of language of spiritual warfare uh, the, these people, the, whoever the opposite people are from us, they're demons, and, and they use language that the New Testament explicitly says does not refer to flesh and blood uh, to wrestle with flesh and blood. I mean, how, how does that happen? Um, this is the question that yeah. I've been wrestling with for, for several years. You, you've been a huge help in, in helping me wrestle with that. But um, look, we have a discipleship problem, huge discipleship problem. Um, hmm. Let's take out the fact that I, I think you and I agree that everybody that calls themselves evangelical when they get asked as they're walking out of the voting booth does not necessarily actually mean they're a, uh, you know somebody right. that truly believes that Jesus is Lord and their Savior. Um, you know, the people that actually think that they are Christians, but aren't necessarily producing fruit. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have, we have a huge discipleship problem in the church. Um, so it, to me, it's like, uh, as I look at the problem set that our country is facing on one hand, I'm like, oh my goodness, look at these resilience factors that like, this is social science, right? Like mm-hmm. we, they've done 20 years of research into how, Why do people radicalize and what can we do to prevent radicalization? And the answers that they come up with, I'm like, oh, the the church has the answer for this. Oh, my Mm -hmm. gosh. I mean, maybe I shouldn't be so surprised, right? Like Jesus, Jesus is like truly um, if if we were to be doing the body of Christ correctly, we would be addressing and building these resilience factors in people, even even if they're not believers, right? Like, yeah. but just us being an extension of God's love, that that would be tremendous in our country that is hurting and searching for answers. Um, and yet, the flip side of that is the very mm. place that could be offering help is actually the place where the sickness is, and mm. and I I. I mean, this is like, that's, you know, a, a, a much deeper conversation to be had, but my, my, the core of, of what I've observed is that we just have a lot of people that are an inch deep and they've never 
walked through trials biblically. They they mm-hmm. haven't learned that um, we we're not showing up to church on Sunday uh, because it's a community social function and and that's it. Or it's your identity for politics and it, it, there is. There should be something much deeper going on, and we seem to lack the the Christian formation um, to produce mature believers. And I I fully expect a younger believer to struggle with this, but but clearly in the last five to ten years, we, we have seen a number of people who are believers or think that they're believers um, choose an idol choose man as their savior. And mm-hmm. it, um, what comes to mind is Jeremiah 17, five, um, through eight, where it, the warning to the Israelites is don't trust man. Man is not, mm-hmm. um, going to save you here. And, and that is going to leave you, um, in a desert, um, and that we only trust the Lord. And so as the, those grievances start to come in as COVID sets in, which don't get me wrong. I mean, hugely devastating for, for certain parts of this country, more devastating than others, but it just was such a, a a thing that rocked us, like unlike anything we had ever experienced. So absolutely. That's a huge trial. And yet Mm -hmm. we, we kept looking to, government and to man and to, you know, take, you know, wanting, like, what do you do when you feel out of control? You, you try to go gain control, right? Like, and it was mm-hmm. driven by anger, driven by, um, uh, trying to, trying to, to address those, um, needs because something had been taken from us and, and it wasn't a, let's turn to the Lord. It wasn't a, yeah. I'm going to trust God here. Um, at societally, I mean, there are plenty of healthy, yeah. good churches that sure. did this very yeah. well. I don't mean to d- dismiss yeah. that, but societally, we just, we clearly were exposed that the, the church in America is not deeply rooted. It is not producing good fruit. We have a, a, a pretty big discipleship problem. Well, you know, the pastors, what pastors would say uh, is, how do I even start to address this? Because uh, all of those inputs that you're talking about, uh, that people are, are getting, maybe they're getting their news sources from the internet or from a, a really bombastic sort of cable news or, or something else, that's all coming at them all the time. And a pastor says, how do I even start to address that when I have an hour a week in a good situation, maybe two hours, uh, but that's really it. H- how can they, st- how can pastors or, or leaders or, or others, how, how can you even start with something like that when that's hitting people all the time? Um, I, would say that the things that built the resilience factors for me um, were plant were seeds planted 15 years ago. Mm. Um, and it was in-depth Bible study. It was being in a small group and praying for people. It was um, having normal trials and having people around me point me to the Lord and say, you can trust him. He will provide. Right. Um, and it, it's that daily walking out that when we, my husband and I reached a point in 2015, actually, um, and, and started to see that the political party I had been associated with was, um, acting in a way that just, it, it felt very disconnected from my values and from my principles that I thought that party was associated with. Mm-hmm. And it, it allowed me to feel safe to start to go, I, I need to, de- to, I'll use the word deconstruct here, but it was a deconstruction of uh, not my faith as much as like my politics was too involved in my faith. Um, mm-hmm. And I, and I had to, you know, go through a process, I, I would argue, I'm still kind of going through the process to say, like, how much of what I believe politically is really just a cultural version of Christianity versus what does the Bible actually teach? Mm-hmm. And and thankfully that I had time and community and a lot of a lot of time in the word 
so that when that process needed to happen, while it was unsettling, it wasn't um, like the rug was being pulled out from underneath me. Um, I, I say that to say like, you know, 15 years and I was raised in a Christian home and had gone to Christian school and I'd read, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I have a, a, a decent background from which to have been able to do that work. I don't think that this is something that happens quickly. I really yeah. do think that we are in a generational process here. And I, and I don't, the Lord can do whatever he wants. He could pour out the Holy Spirit tomorrow mm-hmm. and eyes be opened. But I do, do think that we're in this period of great deception of a lot of people. And so for the pastors and the parents and um, the ministry leaders who are looking at the size of the problem and going, what do I do? You know, Do be faithful where God has placed you and trust that even if it's just a handful of people that you are shepherding or encouraging, like God has a purpose for that. But yeah. as I know you have spoken about before, what the church looks like 50 years from now, it, it probably is not going to look as big um, as it did 50 years ago. And mm-hmm. that's maybe okay, because then mm-hmm. maybe we're we're being pruned to get back to that good fruit. And, and for the souls that are actually lost and don't realize it, that might be a good thing. It might be a really good thing for them to come to the discovery that they've been worshiping a false god in their politics and um, their societal, um, uh, you know, uh, beliefs, um, as opposed to the the creator of the universe. And it, like the the more we can draw a contrast and and just walk faithfully it's very and i would say quietly it doesn't have to be something very loud but faithfully teach the scriptures the scriptures will convict i mean i i it was the book of jeremiah for me and Mm. studying it when my my 11 year old was you know uh, i think he was one years old right like so 10 years ago Mm. i'm studying the book of jeremiah and like the lord has convicted me over and over and over again on a whole bunch of things you know it could it could be any book of the bible that you are called to preach through um and the lord can use it um, but there is nothing for that can replace just the study teaching of god's word and being in community with people and encouraging people to keep looking at Jesus and not the chaos that's around us. Um, that that's that is the the great resilience factor, right? Like yeah. we know where our hope is. It's not here. You know, it sounds like as you're talking, I'm thinking about uh, conversations I've had. I've I've gotten to where I've started asking um, people who are experts in this sort of thing. I'll always ask, what's what's something that uh, people can do to help young people who right now it seems maybe they're going to college or trade school or going out on their own and are facing tremendous mental health uh, issues. And I said, I'll always ask, what's the one thing? And every one of them has said, it's not about making sure that your children leave without mental health issues. It's whether or not there have been manageable crises, that the best thing you can do is to not keep your child from crises and difficulties, but to have manageable uh, difficulties and to walk with them through it so that they understand uh, how to learn in little things and and then in big things that Jesus uh, teaches. It sounds like that's almost what you're saying at a societal level, that what we're talking about is not the kind of health where we have everything together, but we have the the skill sets to be able to hit those potholes and not run off the road. Am I interpreting that right? Absolutely. And I love, I love that vision. That's great for me as a mom to keep in mind (laughs) when I I just want to protect them. Um, But yes, no, there's, there's something to, you know, going through the small thing. And when the next trial comes along and it's harder, you can look back, right? Jesus, you know, God, God's constantly telling Israel to remember, remember his faithfulness. And, and, you know, he, he will, um, he will 
prepare us for that next trial if you, if you let him, if, mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. pay attention to what he might be leading you uh, to learn or to, to um, be engaged with. Uh, but yes, yeah, societally, it's, it's kind of similar. Like we need, um, we, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to borrow from a, a Homeland Security metaphor. Um, I recall uh, 2005, Hurricane Katrina. I was working at the White House at the time, um, and we were the team. I, I was the, on the counterterrorism team, but I got pulled in to do uh, response. And, of course, afterwards, there was a whole bunch of lessons learned and how could this happen. And I just remember having this moment of the American people think that their government is God. That they mm. actually seem to think that we should be powerful and strong enough to never let a bad thing happen. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can, can't totally blame the American people. The politicians, when they run for office, kind of make all these promises that we, we can solve all of society's ills. We can fix it all. We can mm -hmm. protect you. We can keep you safe. And the, the reality is... Um, we are, we are, as humans, so small. Yeah. And um, a healthy respect for um, not only the, the nature and mm -hmm. uh, things that we can't control um, keeps us humble uh, to be able to, to um, not get into this uh, false sense of um, entitlement and, and uh, belief that we can control things. Um, and, and if even you know, take, if you take the, the religious perspective out of it, like just even having a, a humble perspective of, of humanity um, when the trial comes helps you to go, yeah, some bad things happen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it makes it, the grievance less likely to be exploited as, you know, oh, see, somebody's out to get you. It's that conspiracy yeah. mentality when bad things happen. There's got to be a, a reason for this. There's got to be a reason why COVID happened and, and ruined, you know, the plans I had or, yeah. um, you know, took somebody uh, away from me or took, a, you know, my lifestyle away from me. Mm -hmm. and, and you want to blame someone. And if we all had a little bit more humility about the limitations that we have as human beings, that we can't do it all. I do. Yeah. I do think that there's a modern sickness. Um, Alan Noble's book talks about this. That we just have been sold this bag of lies that we can have it all, that mm -hmm. we can self-actualize, that we can um, be our own. And there's yeah. like tremendous burden in trying to be your own, and yeah. um, and that leads to tremendous anxiety and depression. Yeah. And. And so it, if we could, I, 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 clearly, I think Jesus is the solution here that we belong mm -hmm. to, to him and not, not as our own. But if you want to take it at a broader societal level, if, if we could restore to um, society a sense of respect for the limited nature of human beings, the mm -hmm. fact that we do need to live in community, we are we can't just be our own. Um, that 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 has, I think, led to things like significantly um, higher rates of anxiety in teen girls, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the ap apathetic uh, challenge of young men ending up in their parents' basements uh, playing video games. To the incel culture, involuntary celebrate, which is. Mm -hmm. um, responsible for some pretty violent uh, mass attacks in recent years, like all of that's coming from this place of feeling a sense of hopelessness because we yeah. think we're supposed to be able to achieve this and we find out that we can't. And then it, you know, we, we end up either struggling to try to over overcome and achieve the thing that we, we could have sworn we were supposed to have, or we just give up. And, mm -hmm. and we've got to, reframe society's goals in a way yeah. that bring back some of our humanity that um, I, that would then allow us to have the, some of those resilience factors to deal with the potholes in life. Well, what about, because I know I started out talking about young men, particularly in kind of next generation radicalization, but it's very rare that I hear from someone saying my son or my big brother or whoever uh, has gone off and joined the 
Proud Boys. That has happened, but not not often. What does happen every day is I hear from young Christians who will say, what do I do about my mom and dad who have really uh, gotten into Maybe it's QAnon or maybe it's some sort of uh, – uh, I've, I've known people whose parents have gotten involved in left-wing kinds of conspiracy theories too, kind of echo um, echo conspiracy type things as well. But they've gotten involved in a conspiracy theory or they're, they've been radicalized, not in the sense that they're going to take up arms, but they're just angry and scared. And these younger Christians will say, look, I don't want to argue with my mom and dad. I love my mom and dad. I want to spend time with them. What do I do? So all of the data and research tells us you cannot argue somebody out of their ideology. So if they're fully radicalized, if they're you know, hook, line, and sinker in, the best thing you can do is to love them and to be there. Mm. Um the people that have successfully been de-radicalized from extremist ideologies will tell you the key factor in their de-radicalization was love. Yeah. Which makes sense because when we look at why people radicalize, it's because they're searching for uh, belonging and significance. Mm -hmm. So the antidote to that being love it actually makes complete rational sense. But it's the exact opposite of what we want to do in the moment when some, yeah. a loved one is telling you, you know, you got to believe me about these QAnon deep staters and mm -hmm. you got to protect your kids. It, it can be really, really difficult to have those conversations. Um, so I, I, I'm not saying this flippantly, but um, it, it usually does not help to try to have to engage on the conversation itself, but being present, loving them. And you never know when, I mean, prayer, obviously, yeah. pray, pray, pray. And you just never know when that opening might occur. Um, it, it may take years mm -hmm. and it, it mm -hmm. may never happen. Um, the When we look at it uh, from a counterterrorism perspective, we often say the goal is disengagement, not de-radicalization. Oh, because it's easier to convince somebody to disengage from potentially harmful behavior, potentially violent behavior, than it is for them to give up their ideology. Um, uh -huh. But sometimes when you can get them to disengage, you know, time passes, other things come up in life, and eventually they will move off of that ideology. Mm -hmm. And you... You certainly, if they're open to doing counseling, um, that's that would obviously be a great thing. It's just that when somebody is in, deep in that radicalized place, they're they're unlikely to be able to um, be talked out of it. Um, here's uh, one counter to that: before somebody is fully radicalized, when they're in this what we would call um, radicalization curious stage. So they're just kind you, of checking out uh, things and looking yes. at news sources. Yeah. That is a great time to try to counter ideology um, or disinformation or whatever it is that they've been exposed to. Um, but the best way to do it is to suggest um, not that you certainly don't approach it as you're an idiot or yeah. um, you, know, you don't want to belittle them. You want to suggest that they might be being manipulated. Because we as human beings do not like the idea that we're being manipulated. Yeah. Um, so you could do some research. If you are not vulnerable, I would not suggest if somebody is psychologically vulnerable that they go to try to research ideologies. But if you are, um, uh, you know, in a, in a good place, you can go do some research on those ideologies. Um, and you can easily find through a number of good organizations. ADL is really great at this. Um, and uh, uh, my company Moonshot does work in this space as well. Um, but there are a number of uh, experts out there that that understand that ideology and can poke holes in it. Mm -hmm. the, but you want to be a little nuanced and sophisticated in how you do it. So, Because what you don't want is for that person to feel like they're being made fun of yeah. or that you are... Um, uh, you know, thinking less of them. It's, it's more about, you know, you want to ask a lot of questions. You want to, yeah. you want to uh, better understand the perspective where they're coming from and then gently ask questions that insert a little bit of doubt. You're not going to get that done in one visit, one conversation. Mm -hmm. It does 
it does take time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but it certainly, if you, especially as a parent with a kid, you're more likely to, to have the opportunity to see what they're looking at or, or to have those conversations. It's a little different when somebody's living outside of your house, but, um, you know, if, if you have that relationship ongoing with somebody, um, it, it is, absolutely something to try to uh, equip yourself to be able to do. And if if you do get to a place where um, you are concerned about somebody going a little too far, um, there are groups like Life After Hate or Parents for Peace. Um, mm-hmm. They have websites. Uh, the McCain Institute recently put together a guide on um, helping parents and teens, parents of teens to know what to look for if uh, they're engaging with harmful content online. So there are a number of resources out there now to be able to help you figure out the right way to have that conversation. Hmm. So it sounds like what you're saying is in most cases, what you're trying to do, if your mom and dad are, you know, wanting to talk about Bill Gates is taking us all over with microchips or whatever, that what you're trying to do is not so much subtract something, their ideas about that, as it is to add something, that connection and keep the connection um, as much as you can going forward. Is that, am I seeing that right? Absolutely. Um, If you are concerned that the individual is considering joining a group that might be violent, that might be a step at which your engagement might look a little different and or might involve asking law enforcement for help. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you're, if we're just talking about, and this is the case for most of us with older parents, they're not in a position to do something violent. Right. So, so for most, it's a a matter of like, how do I handle Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas gatherings um, and do that in a way that still honors them and loves them, but also, um, you know, lets them know that I'm concerned. Yeah. And, and it, yes, it is, it is about, I love you no matter what. And mm-hmm. when you have those opportunities to point them to something healthier, like scripture, like, uh, you know, have you been in church lately? Have you, are you doing a Bible study? Like anything that can redirect them to something healthier, get their mind focusing on other things. That's really great. Um, I realize that for many, especially as people advance in age, it's harder to get out of the house. They have more time on their hands to watch yeah. the TV and watch, yeah. uh, the, uh, be on the, the computer. So it, it, it's challenging, but it, yeah. the most important thing is your presence in their life your unconditional love. Mm. You know, Elizabeth, one of the things that really is concerning me right now, um, I mean, as we're recording this, uh, we're in the aftermath of a a news cycle where uh, Kanye West, artist formerly known as Kanye West, um, has been spewing not just anti-Semitic stuff, but uh, pro-Hitler stuff. We find out that Former president, your old boss, hosted um, Kanye West and a a literal Nazi sympathizer, Nick Fuentes, uh, at his at his house for a, a meal. And you you stop and you say, wait a minute, I didn't really think that in 2022 what we would be arguing about are Nazis, you know. And it it just seems to me as though um, the 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 Overton window just keeps kind of moving uh, and, and the kinds of things that we're having to confront and deal with, it's getting more unpredictable and more bizarre. Is that just because I haven't been paying close enough attention to what's been going on, on for 50 years or is it really a unique sort of time? Certainly the internet, um, it allows things to be in our face in a way that 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you know, you would have to be in a certain community in order to see it. Um, it's funny when... But, but I mean, Dwight Eisenhower wasn't um, having dinner with Nazis. I mean, so that, that is Fair. different. I mean, even but we didn't if, know. if you go back to the 20s, we, we uh-huh. had, you know, uh, yeah. some famous generals in World War yeah. uh, II and, and some Supreme Court justices that yeah. were wearing clans hoods enough. and watching down Pennsylvania That's Avenue. Right. So, yeah, so yeah. yeah, I mean... It, the, America has a race problem, a racism mm-hmm. problem. We have an anti-Semitism problem. Um, 
And it's hard, you know, when the, the dinner with Ye happened, uh, my first reaction was like, well, yeah, this is who he is. I, mm-hmm. <laughs> I just kind yeah. of am like, I, it was hard for me to even know what, like, do maybe we just shouldn't cover it anymore because he's already shown that it's not that he's going to go join a Nazi group, Trump, in this case. It's not that Trump's going to go jo- join a Nazi group. It's just that he wants the support of the Nazis or whoever else. And he, Mm -hmm. if you like him, then he will like you. That is his MO. Mm -hmm. Um, And has no filter unless he has uh, the, the adults around him to be able to know like, Oh yeah, no, you can't do that. You can't, (laughs) you can't have dinner with a neo-Nazi and an anti-Semite. And uh, so in one, this is his character. This this is um, shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. And yet, um, at the same time, I, I find it a little concerning that I, I don't know if we're doing a good job of, of educating the, the younger generations about everything from uh, anti-Semitism to, uh, you know, white supremacy to like, it is yeah. kind of interesting to me that the reason this seems to be able to grow and spread and that it has become mainstream is because people don't have that sharp memory of the yeah. Holocaust. And yeah. um, it's faded enough to where, we're like, oh, it's okay. I mean, like, I don't believe that stuff, but mm-hmm. yeah, if they want to be in my party, that's cool. And you know, they they can give me money, they can get my vote, and mm-hmm. and there used to be it used to be so seared on um, the collective conscience that it just there was a natural uh, purge or pushback anytime something would try to get into that mainstream. And that's gone now. Um, it's it is it is. Uh, rather concerning to me that we as a society don't seem to be aware of how dangerous some of these ideologies are. Well, you know, Elizabeth, you're a Christian and yet you're working, I don't don't mean and yet, but, and also you're working in these areas that are really dark. I mean, domestic uh, terrorism and um, racial radicalization and child exploitation and trafficking, all of these issues. I mean, these are heavy, heavy uh, issues. How do you work in that area and just not give up and just collapse under it? Uh, You know, it, it just seems like that would be, it would take a unique kind of preparation to, to keep your heart from getting to despair when you look at all these ugly things? Oh, that's, it's funny. I, I think the first uh, 10, 15 years of my career were so driven by um, a single-minded desire to make sure that what I felt on 9-11, no other American would ever have to feel again. Mm-hmm. And I and I say that in a personal sense, but I know that every single one of the colleagues that I've worked with during that time period, that that's what it was for us. Um, never again. We're not mm-hmm. going to let that happen. Um, and in some ways, that allows you to kind of ignore some of these uh, side effects. And I, I would say that some some of the people that have um, come into the field, into counterterrorism and um, countering extremism field in the last 10 years have done maybe a good job of uh, educating us older people <laughs> about mm-hmm. the importance of taking care of our own mental health and um, that these uh, that exposure to these ideas, exposure to um, uh, the constant stress of fear of the next attack, um, can it does take a toll. It takes a toll mm-hmm. on families and on your mental health. Um, and the the moment that I where I am now, both uh, in the work that I'm doing, and then um, compared to where I was as a very young person um, during the post 9-11 period, um, the Lord provided in both uh, periods, but it was, it's been different. And mm-hmm. the 
uh, first period, I look back and my faith was pretty weak at the time. Um, and I totally credit my, my uh, parents and others um, who were praying for me um, mm-hmm. and preserving me during that time period. Mm-hmm. And in the more recent years, um, I went, went through those trials we talked about earlier and you, you start to realize that it, and this comes down to nuance. You, you can both want good things for your country, um, and want to provide a safer place for your children and know that the ultimate hope is not here Yeah. and that God, I know what, I know how it all ends. Yeah. So not that doesn't mean that there isn't pressure from time to time um, yeah. and tough calls to make and life and death at times. Um, not not inside government, not not outside government. Um, yeah. But when you're able to lean into the Lord for that, there's mm-hmm. an aspect of like, I believe in his sovereignty and I mm-hmm. believe uh, that he is good and that not that horrible things don't happen in this world. They do. Um, but it, I guess it's those two things. I, I cling to his sovereignty. I cling to his goodness. And then I, I constantly am preaching the gospel to myself and, and refixing my eyes, but that hope in yeah. what is coming, not in the present circumstances and however he wants to use me, my family, um, others that I can encourage to perform his work is great. Like that's, mm. that's what it is. But I will tell you, I, it was maybe two years ago, uh, right after the 2020 election, um, that I really felt God stripping away like, oh, you, you think hope is going to come from mm-hmm. a, a healthier government or you think hope is going to come from a party coming together and like realizing that they had been, uh, you know, deceived, mm-hmm. like, nope. Nope, no. <laughs> it's not no. coming from anything worldly. And and so I, I still, you know, am convicted from time to time of, oh, I was I was placing my hope in something um, that God did not design me to, to put my hope in. Uh, mm. So it's still like a daily thing that I have to work on. But um, no. but that, that that's that's how I endure the uh, the dark pieces of it. But can I also say one other thing? Like yeah. when you start to understand the why people buy into this ideology it actually creates an empathy um because in a in a bit of like there but for the grace of god go i Mm -hmm. um like i i you know hit the jackpot and and being born to you know godly parents and you know getting to live in this country Mm -hmm. and um you know, getting to be able to study scripture or even access to the Bible, right? Like all yeah. of those are huge blessings. And um, when when you see the the darker side, yes, it turns your stomach, but at the same time, it's also um, kind of a contrast of absent that blessing. Like when you see evil kind of reigning um, in somebody's life, it 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 creates an empathy um, yeah. that. Uh, allows you to to try to f- you're constantly figuring out like how not only can how can I protect potential victims, but how can I help that person who yeah. really is in a dark dark place? Yeah. Last question for you: What if there's a 17 year old Elizabeth Newman uh, who's listening to this uh, show today who thinks maybe God's calling her into government? in some way, maybe in national security, maybe in counterterrorism, maybe in some other uh, way. But she she thinks that's kind of the way that God's God's designed her and, and sort of the direction that she's going. What advice would you have for her? Oh, man, that's such a great question. Um, one, be grounded in a biblical community. Hmm. Um, it is tough work. And you need godly people around you to encourage you and to pray for you and, um, to be rooted in scripture. Uh, and I, and I don't mean, I don't mean that in the Christian nationalist view of the world. I mean, you know, just so that you can, um, know where your hope is coming from. Um, Mm. and then, uh, find, find a, uh, there's some excellent programs out there in national security, um, and in uh, uh, Homeland Security, depending on 
which field you want to go into, but um, it is there are a number there are a number of different tracks. My career was a very um, abnormal one, so I, I don't know that it's one that you can plan. Uh, mm-hmm. But what I can glean from my experience, it was take advantage of the opportunities as they come up. You never know what kind of door might open, and you and you go, well, that's not what I. That's not the path. That's not what I planned. But sometimes God opens those doors and, and redirects you into a, a different way. So be open to mm-hmm. those opportunities. Um, be humble. Be hungry. Um, work hard. Um, all of those, uh, sadly, in mm-hmm. the workforce, finding uh, somebody that's a hard worker and humble is uh, harder and harder to come by. Mm-hmm. Um, read a lot. I read, 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 read. Mm. That's a good word. Elizabeth Newman, I'm thankful uh, to God for your expertise and your heart, and it's been great to have you on the program today. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Russell. I loved being with you guys today. Thanks for listening. Links are always in the show notes for resources mentioned in this episode, including a link about how you can have a trial membership to Christianity Today. Be sure to subscribe to the program, send a, send an episode along to a friend who might benefit from it, and leave us a review when you can. It helps other people to find the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Russell Moore, and this is The Russell Moore Show from Christianity Today. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Hosted by Russell Moore. Produced by Ashley Hales. Associate producers, Abby Perry and Azure Phelps. CT administration provided by Christine Kolb. Social media by Kate Lucky. Director of operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Production assistance provided by Core Media. Audio engineer is Kevin Duthu. Coordinator is Beth Grabencourt. Video producer is John Rowland. The theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. 